Thank you for joining me today. My name is Lieutenant Commander Eric Rowlander. I'm the Chief Staff Officer of Task Force Shore Battle Space at Naval Support Activity Bahrain. Today I will be presenting to you on the final months of anxiety. To explain, University of Illinois Professor Peter Fritchie once defined the 1920s as years of affluence. In the time period immediately following World War I, people throughout the world were generally making money and enjoying new luxuries such as the radio, the automobile, and the airplane. Professor Peter Fritchie defined the 1930s as the years of anxiety. The Great Depression took the world by storm. Adolf Hitler was coming to power in Nazi Germany, and if you look to Asia, you will find that Imperial Japan was waging a war of aggression against China, as well as showing signs of expanding militarily throughout the Pacific. By late 1941, the United States had formally entered World War II. Unlike in Europe, it had been predetermined the U.S. would stage forces in England for the eventual liberation of Nazi-occupied Europe. In Asia, the war against Japan would be very ambiguous. After all, the main U.S. battle fleet lay disabled at Pearl Harbor. There was not one concrete plan to fight back against Imperial Japan. For the first five months at the Pacific Theater in World War II, the Imperial Japanese military would roam free and almost unstoppable as they would expand the island perimeter. I call the first five months of the Pacific Theater of World War II the final months of anxiety. For the final months of anxiety, I define them to be 8 December 1941, the day after the Pearl Harbor attack, through 8 May 1942, the final day of the Battle of the Coral Sea. Before I get started, I have a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Illinois with a focus in military history. I have a Master of Arts degree in National Security Studies from the Naval War College. I've conducted a number of formal historical analysis in the past, mostly in 20th century warfare. And with that said, let's get moving. After the Pearl Harbor attack on 7 December 1941, Japan rapidly advanced throughout the Pacific. But during the evening hours of 7 December 1941, immediately after the Pearl Harbor attack, all was not lost. The Allies still had five countries opposing Japan. Australia, Britain, the Netherlands, America, and the Philippines. And in fairness, the Philippines were a colony of the United States at that time. The United States still had three aircraft carriers that survived the Pearl Harbor attack. There were two British battleships and a four-deployed fleet called the U.S. Asiatic Fleet. Two cruisers, 13 destroyers, and 29 submarines stationed out of the Philippines. There was a strong, offensive U.S. Air Force in the Philippines. The U.S. Army Air Force had B-17s and P-40s. And there was various island garrisons made up of Australian, Dutch, American, and British troops, in addition to the Philippine Army. But there was a problem. There was no overall command and control structure, so not any one military commander could direct all the defensive forces for a coordinated defense against Imperial Japan's attack. Now, Wake Island is considerably further back from the Japanese Marianas and closer to the Hawaiian Islands, and so Wake Island was allowed to fortify their position in the run-up to World War II. Beach defenses were under command of Major James Devereux, with a battalion of Marines that were under strength, 449 Marines and about 68 sailors. He had also with him six 5-inch coastal artillery guns and initially a squadron of 12 Wildcat fighters. And while Wake Island was warned of the Pearl Harbor attack, the Japanese commenced airstrikes on 8, 9, and 10 December. During the first airstrike, eight of the 12 Wildcat fighters were caught on the ground and destroyed. But Major Devereux had ordered four of the Wildcat fighters into the air and they would survive the initial onslaught. Now the Japanese aerial bombers returning to the Marshall Islands reported that they did not really see a lot of fortifications there. And as such, on the morning of 11 December, the Imperial Japanese Navy sa sailed with a fleet under Rear Admiral Sadamichi Kajioka to attack Wake Island, but without air cover. It was deemed unnecessary. He had with him three heavy cruisers, six destroyers, two trip transports, and 450 Marines. Major Devereux saw the fleet coming in early morning hours, 
and lured the Japanese fleet to within two miles of Wake Island. He held his fire and had well camouflaged his fortifications as well as his gun batteries. When he gave the order to open fire, the first Japanese destroyer of the war would be sunk, the Hayate, by multiple salvo hits from the 5-inch guns. Most of the rest of the Japanese ships would be damaged by 5-inch gun fire, and Rear Admiral Keijioka started to sail their fleet further and further away from Wake Island. At this point, Major Devru turned to his Wildcat fighters, particularly Captain Henry Elrod, and told them, go get them. The four Wildcat fighters would take off with 100-pound bombs under their wings. And to be clear, typically 100-pound bombs are not used to attack ships. It's usually 500 to 2,000-pound bombs. However, all the Marines had at their disposal was 100-pound bombs, and that's what they used. Captain Henry Elrod would earn the distinction by dropping a 100-pound bomb on a group of depth charges on the Japanese destroyer Kisiarge and be the first man to sink a warship with just a fighter plane. During the first battle of Wake Island, the Japanese would lose two destroyers sunk, over 400 Japanese sailors killed. While Major Devereux lost eight of his 12 Wildcat fighters, only 23 U.S. Marines were killed in the battle. It was arguably the only full-scale amphibious assault repulsed in the whole Pacific theater of World War II and proved that you need to have air and sea superiority before attacking an island. Daily airstrikes would commence from the Marshall Islands on Wake Island by the Japanese after this disaster. It was the first tactical victory for the United States in World War II. It would turn into a siege of attrition, however. The four Wildcats would go up to oppose the Japanese bombers, which would become two Wildcats, and finally by 22 December, the Wake Island defenders lost their last Wildcat fighter. Now Pearl Harbor, the Pacific Fleet's headquarters, knew about the success the Marines were having at Wake, and they did try to hastily organize a relief force. USS Saratoga, one of the remaining aircraft carriers with Admiral Fletcher, would set sail with the Marine Corps fighter squadron, reinforcements, and more ammunition. However, they would still be one full day sail away from Wake by the morning of 23 December 1941 when the Japanese would try to invade again. The second time, Rear Admiral Keijioka would come back with two aircraft carriers detached from the Pearl Harbor attack and two more heavy cruisers. I shall note that the Japanese did not relieve him. They gave him a second chance. This time the assault was at pre-dawn hours and he put 2,500 Japanese Marines ashore at five different beachheads. Four were on the main island of Wake and one on the neighboring island of Wilkes. Wilkes Island successfully counterattacked at the Japanese beachhead. 37 U.S. Marines encircled the 90 Japanese Marines attacked from two points, killing 88 Japanese Marines, taking two prisoner, and counterattacking eastward. Now, the installation commander was Commander Winfield Cunningham. He was coordinating with Major Devereux in the command bunker. Commander Cunningham sent the message to Pearl Harbor. The enemy has landed. The issue is in doubt. It was admittedly a poor choice of words. Pearl Harbor took this to mean the enemy has landed. Wake Island will likely fall. What Commander Cunningham meant was, the enemy has landed, I'll get back to you. Notwithstanding, Pearl Harbor called off Admiral Fletcher's relief force. No more help was going to head to Wake Island. Commander Cunningham, Major Devereux, they looked out their bunker and they saw lots of Japanese flags. They assumed this to mean that U.S. positions were being overrun. In actuality, they were Japanese signal flags. They had been confused. After discussion, Commander Cunningham and Major Devereux agreed to surrender Wake Island. However, after the heroic defense, Imperial Japan ultimately gained nothing. They had lost 820 killed, 333 wounded, five ships sunk, two more would be destroyed during the second invasion attempt, and the Japanese lost a submarine in attempting to blockade Wake Island, in addition to 28 aircraft being shot down during the siege. 122 Americans were killed, with the rest being captured. But Japan never truly got to use Wake Island again during the Second World War. It was a total waste. U.S. forces would isolate Wake Island and actually use it as bombing practice as their forces would sail further east during World War II. Now, on New Year's Day, 1942, the ABDA command would be stood up. ABDA command was a command and control structure 
to finally place one military officer in charge of all the defense units. It was an old World War I model to pool resources under one commander, just like Ferdinand Foch had been the supreme allied commander in World War I. In this case, General Archibald Wavell was tasked with taking over Supreme Command. Now, General Wavell was not a poor choice. He had combat experience in the North African theater and had defeated Italian armies in the defense of Egypt in an attempted invasion of Libya during World War II. Almost immediately, though, he had problems because the Japanese had attained naval superiority in the Dutch East Indies, which limited the ABDA's logistical movement of ships and reinforcements and ammunition and supplies. Ultimately, the ABDA structure would fail, but its dissolution would lead to, ultimately, the successful command structure. This would be three separate combatant commands. General Wavell would take Burma and India. General MacArthur would ultimately take the Pacific Southwest, and Admiral Nimitz, the Central Pacific. General Wavell would keep the road open for Burma and India. General MacArthur would lead the march back to the Philippines, and Admiral Nimitz, the march to Okinawa. By having three separate combatant commands, it would ultimately confuse the Japanese as to where the next Allied offensive would come, which would lead to success in the Pacific. This was the structure of the ABDA command. Again, General Wavell was the supreme commander. At the top, his deputy was an American, Lieutenant General George Brett. And then they had sea, air, and ground components, just like NAVCENT, AFCENT, and RCENT are to CENTCOM. Philippines were slightly... Uh, unique, so General D Douglas MacArthur was allowed to branch off independently. Now by January, General MacArthur had taken his army and fallen back to the Bataan Peninsula. At this point, the battle had become a stalemate. The Bataan Peninsula was strategic since it overlooked Manila Bay and prevented the Japanese U Navy from using Manila Harbor. General Hama the Japanese general in charge of the invading forces in an attempt to break the stalemate had put 2,000 soldiers on barges and intended to sail them down the peninsula in an attempted end run. If you look at the diagram, the black lines to the left of the peninsula are known as exterior lines of operation. There is risk associated with doing an end run like this as you can easily lose communication and lines of supply with your parent command. Japanese attempted their end run only to be intercepted by Lieutenant John Bulkley in Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 3, as well as 600 U.S. sailors, soldiers, and Marines in the rear area, as well as some surviving P-40 fighters. In the end, only 43 of 2,000 Japanese soldiers would survive the Battle of the Points as they were surrounded into pockets and eventually eliminated one by one. This was a result of a U.S. tactical victory and the fight would go on in the Philippines. We'll move on to Java. Despite many brave Allied actions, the Japanese advance could not be stopped. Java was the hub of the Dutch government in exile at the time. With the Japanese fleet sighted heading towards Java, Dutch Admiral Carol Dorman gathered five cruisers and nine destroyers to try to oppose the Japanese fleet. The Imperial Japanese Navy under Admiral Takeo Takagi with four cruisers and 14 destroyers sailed towards Java in an attempt to win the sea for an amphibious assault there. What would follow would be the largest surface engagement since the Battle of Jutland in 1916. At the Battle of the Java Sea, the ABDA encountered a number of problems offhand. First, you have four different countries, multiple different languages, only one ABDA ship had radar, they were older ships, they were outgunned, they had no unit training. The Dutch and Americans, they had never worked together before, and it was not common for the Americans to work with the British Navy at the time. Initially, Carol Dorman attempted a gunnery duel to try to maintain a standoff range to stay away from the Japanese torpedoes. Frustrated by his inability to score decisive hits on the Japanese ships, he sent out a message. All ships, follow me. He closed the range, and almost immediately, the Japanese launched a salvo of their long lance torpedoes. What followed was complete disaster. Five ABDA ships were sunk, two cruisers and three destroyers, with over 2,300 Allied sailors killed. Carol Dorman would go down with his ship. Strategically, the ABDA was now destroyed. They no longer had an effective naval force 
or air force to oppose the Japanese attacks. All that was left was various island garrisons who could not be supported. Now, if you notice, I didn't even bother to list the Japanese casualties. It was only 1% that of the ABDA. They lost about 30 sailors themselves and only took a few minor hits on their ships. Now, I'll step back to the Philippines. While the Japanese do have a naval blockade stopping any resupply ships from heading to the Philippines, it's not necessarily airtight. As uh, General MacArthur was able to prove, he could get certain personnel out if he needed to. On New Year's Day, 1942, General MacArthur and his staff had an ingenious idea. They turned the SS Mac-10 into a makeshift hospital ship. There was a Swiss consulate in the Philippines, and Switzerland is home to the International Red Cross at Geneva, Switzerland. The Swiss consulate came aboard, certified Mach 10 as a makeshift hospital ship, painted it white with red crosses, and removed anything of military value. A copy of the ship's schedule was printed and turned into Japan via Switzerland. While Imperial Japan did not formally say they would not attack the ship, in fairness, Mach 10 did sail safely from the Philippines all the way to Australia without harassment. 310 wounded as well as the medical crew sailed from the Philippines to Australia successfully and were saved. On 20 February 1942, U.S. submarine USS Swordfish sailed in, picked up President Manuel Quezon and his family, and rescued them. Sailed back to Australia and eventually the United States. 11 March 1942, PT boats would rescue General MacArthur, and I'll go more into that in just a moment. 29 April 1942, PBY Catalinas took off with 60 officers, nurses, and civilians. And 3 May 1942, another submarine, the USS Spearfish, would sail out 27 nurses and VIPs. At that point, nurses were viewed as a critical skill, as were code breakers, the wounded, and anyone else who they knew they could not survive as a prisoner of war. That was the precedence in getting personnel out of the Philippines. Now, 11 March 1942, General MacArthur would escape the Philippines. The story behind that is President Roosevelt knew that he needed General MacArthur to direct the counteroffensive to eventually retake the Philippine Islands. General MacArthur did not want to leave, and it took a presidential order for him to finally give up and depart the Philippines. Now, he chose PT boats over a submarine because a submarine that was supposed to sail him out wound up attacking a Japanese ship, and Japanese destroyers in the area were hunting for U.S. submarines, so it made more sense to, to sail out on a PT boat. Now, the same PT boats involved at the Battle of the Points under Lieutenant Bulkley were chosen to take MacArthur from the main island of Luzon in the north to sail him down to Mindanao. They took a total of 22 passengers, including MacArthur's family and some of his staff, and sailed out. Once they re reached Mindanao, they flew via B-17 bomber back to Australia, where General MacArthur would give his speech, I shall return. Lieutenant Bulkley, for his success during the Battle of the Points, his efforts during the defense of the Philippines and rescuing MacArthur, would be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Now, I'll discuss General MacArthur's continuity of operations. Prior to him leaving the Philippines, he had U.S. Army forces far east, which would become the Southwest Pacific Command. He took with him Major General Richard Sutherland, his chief of staff, his deputy chief of staff, his chief engineer in the Army, a chief engineer is one who is responsible for building bases and installations. He had his anti-aircraft commander, his chief of intelligence, his personal aides, and he did have a Navy admiral with him, Rear Admiral Francis Rockwell, who was the region commander of U.S. installations of the Philippines. And although he was in charge of shore installations, he stole an admiral and can advise MacArthur as to how to employ the U.S. Navy with the U.S. Army as General MacArthur would launch his counteroffensive throughout the Southwest Pacific. They would call themselves a baton gang, and they would stay together the rest of the war. And fittingly, in March 1945, they were turned to Corregidor aboard the four PT boats, the same models that they had departed in February and March 1942. So where were the U.S. aircraft carriers in all this? There were still three U.S. aircraft carriers, and I have not discussed them since the attempted relief effort of Wake Island in December 1941. Where Admiral Nimitz had taken power, he was very cautious. So he decided to launch raids on the outside of the Japanese island perimeter, as it would be safer. He directed Admiral William Halsey in the USS Enterprise, as well as Admiral Frank Fletcher aboard USS Yorktown to attack the Marshall and Gilbert Islands. Now, the aims was to draw Imperial Japanese Navy forces away from other areas, train 
and boost U.S. morale. For the training aspect, this was strike warfare for the first time for the U.S. Navy. They'd never done this before. So in February 1942, U.S. Navy commenced raids on the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, causing minor damage to Japanese bases, destroying 18 aircraft, sinking three auxiliary ships, and damaging nine more ships. Again, it was the first time the U.S. had conducted strike warfare, so the planners took some lessons out of this. Fourteen out of 100 U.S. aircraft were lost, mostly because they were running out of fuel. The planners had flown the planes in behind a storm front for cover, and in a tactical situation, you consume more fuel, just like you consume more fuel in higher winds, etc. The airplanes are coming back on fumes, crash landing next to the carrier. Now, it's okay to lose the airplane so long as we can recover the crew. U.S. can always build more airplanes later. We just got to recover the crew, so these are acceptable losses. It does prove Japan's perimeter defense is weak, as the aircraft carriers are able to raid, turn around and run, and leave relatively unscathed. And also sends a message to the Japanese. Is the U.S. really on the defense, or are they on the offense? Now we'll move on to the Bougainville raid attempt. USS Lexington under Admiral Wilson Brown was tasked with attacking a Japanese airfield at Bougainville, an island in the vicinity of New Guinea. Where Admiral Wilson Brown's goal was to use the Lexington to launch a surprise air attack on the Japanese air base. The Japanese air base was supporting the Japanese ground offensive in New Guinea, and the Australians needed to keep New Guinea open. If Australia lost New Guinea, Australia proper could now be threatened. Now, while Lexington was sailing towards Bougainville, the U.S. task force was discovered by Japanese scout planes. Immediately, Admiral Brown ordered his fighters into the air. The American Wildcat fighter was the frontline fighter plane, and on, it was an average fighter. If you took all the fighters throughout World War II, it was average, but it was capable. Now, just like the whales in repulse attack, the Japanese chose the Betty Bomber from the Japanese 4th Air Group to attack Lexington. But they made a mistake. There was no Japanese fighter escort sent with the Betty Bombers when they went to attack the Lexington. As such, 17 of the 19 Japanese bombers would be shot down by Wildcat fighters led by Lieutenant Commander Jimmy Thatch and Lieutenant Ed O'Hare. Lieutenant Ed O'Hare would be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for personally shooting down three Japanese bombers on his own and damaging two more just enough to be shot down by anti-aircraft fire. As a result, the USS Lexington did not take a single bomb or torpedo hit. The entire squadron was virtually annihilated, and as a result, it delayed a Japanese ground offensive in New Guinea since they didn't have the air support. And since the United States was able to knock out the bomber squadron, the Lexington did not have to launch its air raid on Bougainville. Lessons that came out of this, it was proof the U.S. had already learned the mistakes of whales and repulse. They had fighters to defend their ships. And it was also proof that if you're going to send in bombers, you're going to need to send in fighter escorts. And this would come back to taunt the Japanese during the heat of the Battle of Midway in June 1942, which I'll discuss in another lecture. And now we'll move on to the mother of all the raids. The Doolittle Raid. After the Pearl Harbor attack, Franklin Roosevelt had directed a strike on Japan as soon as possible to boost American morale and undermine Japanese leadership. Emperor Hirohito of Japan was viewed as a godlike figure. The emperor and his government had told the Japanese people they would never be attacked by war. And in fairness, Japan had not been attacked by a foreign country since the Mongol invasions centuries many centuries before World War II. Admiral William Halsey aboard USS Enterprise was tasked with escorting the USS Hornet, which carried 16 B-25 bombers under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. They were going to get within about 400 miles of Japan and then launch their bombing strike. However, they were discovered by an Imperial Japanese Navy patrol vessel, which was promptly sunk by Admiral Halsey's cruisers. However, they decided to launch early and play it safe. As a result, they had to launch at 16, 650 miles out instead of 400 miles out and have to fly for 13 hours with no guarantee that they would make it to land after the bombing raid on Tokyo. Now, Doolittle's raiders, they would make it to Tokyo and strike five other cities as well. The targets were primarily military in nature, steel mills, oil farms, power plants. In fact, one Doolittle Raider 
landed a bomb hit on the Japanese aircraft carrier Ryuho, which would not be able to leave port until November 1942. You can argue that that's a mission kill. Now, of the 16 bombers, one flew off to Russia and landed in Vladivostok. The other 15 crash-landed in China right along the coastal area. Of the 80 raiders, three were killed in action, eight were taken prisoner. Japan retaliated along China's coastal provinces, killing over 100,000 Japanese people for their aid of the U.S. Army pilots. The Doolittle Raid was very key. It proved Japan could be attacked. It was the first attack by foreigners since the Mongol invasions in 1281. This is over 600 years earlier. Two army lieutenants were even able to buzz the Japanese imperial palace. They were told not to drop a bomb. They didn't want to kill the emperor, as that would make the Japanese government very difficult to surrender. But they did buzz the palace, forcing Emperor Hirohito to be moved to a bomb shelter. And with that, I'll get into the strategic corporal concept a tactical action that has a strategic impact. The tactical action was the two army bombers flying over the emperor's palace, endangering the emperor. Now imagine the phone call Admiral Yamamoto receives about how the emperor's life is in danger. It's a great embarrassment to the Imperial Japanese Navy to allow American ships to get that close to hit Tokyo and proves the U.S. Navy is still a threat. Admiral Yamamoto then puts the wheels in motion for the opening phases of planning for the Battle of Midway, the goal of which to eliminate the U.S. Navy. So again, a strategic corporal concept, a tactical action that has a strategic impact. The final battle I'll discuss is the Battle of the Coral Sea, which was the first carrier duel in history. U.S. forces under Rear Admiral Frank Fletcher were sent to oppose a Japanese fleet sailing in the vicinity of New Guinea. The Japanese fleet was going to attempt to attain sea superiority for a possible amphibious assault of New Guinea because the ground offensive kept stalling out against the resilient Australian defense. U.S. Navy under Admiral Frank Fletcher had two aircraft carriers, nine cruisers, 14 destroyers, 128 planes. The Japanese Navy under Rear Admiral Inoue had three aircraft carriers, nine cruisers, 15 destroyers, 127 airplanes. Now we fall back. U.S. Navy, one country, one language, one plan of attack, and reasonable equal terms with the Japanese Navy. Let's see how they do. U.S. Navy airstrikes successfully sink the Shoho, a Japanese aircraft carrier. In return, the Japanese sink the American aircraft carrier Lexington and heavily damage the American aircraft carrier Yorktown. Yorktown has to sail back to Pearl Harbor, but before it does so, the U.S. Navy is able to heavily damage a second Japanese aircraft carrier and destroyed so many airplanes of its, the air wing of the third aircraft carrier that it rendered it useless. You can argue the U.S. achieved three mission kills on the Japanese Navy, whereas the Japanese attained two mission kills on the U.S. Navy. Lexington was sunk, Yorktown was heavily damaged and had to withdraw. But since the Imperial Japanese could not attain sea superiority, they would not move forward with an amphibious assault on New Guinea. They had learned their lesson from Wake Island. Do not commit an amphibious assault without air support. So strategically a victory for the U.S., arguably a tactical victory for Imperial Japan, being Lexington was a larger aircraft carrier that was sunk over the Shoho. Notwithstanding, for the first time, there were signs of hope as Japan lost its first capital ships in a frontal battle with the U.S. military. I'll start to conclude this presentation with a quote from Carl von Clausewitz. To achieve victory, we must mass our forces at the hub of all power and movement, the enemy's center of gravity. And that's pretty much what the Japanese did. If you look at the red lines in the diagram, those are known as interior lines of operation, which were sequential and mutually supporting. They drove a wedge between the Philippines, Malaysia, and Australia, rendering the allies incapable of effectively supporting each other. Japanese had good interior lines of operation. They had staging areas um, that were relatively unhindered by the Allied forces. Uh, the offensive B-17s were eliminated on 8 December. The Prince of Wales and Repulse could not sail behind uh, Japanese lines to stop the, the Japanese buildup of soldiers and supplies. Japanese had trained fighter and bomber groups from the war in China, same with skilled sailors and soldiers. Uh, their weapons, Type 93 Long Lance Torpedo, was responsible for establishing sea supremacies in the Dutch East Indies. Further, 
with the possible exception of Wake Island, Japanese took sustainable casualties up until the Battle of Coral Sea. Up until Coral Sea, they had not lost a ship larger than a destroyer. At Coral Sea was the first time they lost capital ships, which were difficult for the Japanese to replace. Now, for the Allied forces, they had limited tactical capabilities. They generally lacked fortifications. Wake Island was fortified, so was Corregidor, but Timor was left open for invasion, as was Guam and much of the Dutch East Indies. There were no international exercises amongst the ABDA prior to World War II. Australia and the U.S. Navy, they had not truly sailed together in exercises, neither did the Dutch or the Americans. The Australian military stretched with the war in Europe. True, Australia was a country in the backyard during the fighting, but they had many divisions of frontline infantry fighting Ur and Rommel in the Desert Fox in North Africa. Additionally, they had to concentrate in New Guinea. If they lost New Guinea, Australia itself could be threatened, and they had to keep Australia open. The Dutch military was meant more for internal security, not for fighting external wars. Dutch officers, on the average, were not fluent in English, made communication more difficult. Available Allied power and sea power was limited. True, the Wildcat fighter was an average fighter and was capable, but there was only a few squadrons. The other aircraft, Brewster Buffaloes from the uh, Britain, B-10 bombers from the Dutch, and DOT-24 DO-24 seaplanes uh, from the Dutch were not numerous or capable enough in opposing the Japanese assaults. U.S. aircraft carriers were few and untried, and Nimitz was very cautious in how he employed them. So did every Allied action matter? Yes, it proved the Japanese were not invincible. All attrition counts. The United States was enabled to eliminate a whole bomber squadron at Bougainville. That takes a long time for the Japanese to replace. Uh, combat experience for U.S. and allies. All experience is experience. General MacArthur, Admiral Holsey, Jimmy Thatch, they would all come back to taunt the ja Japanese later on in World War II. Japanese military overstretched themselves. The New Guinea offensive uh, would stall. The Philippine resistance movement would be very effective in tying down other Japanese soldiers throughout the Pacific, as was Timor's guerrilla war, where the Japanese were putting six troops down for every one Australian and Dutch soldier. Garrisons for Wake and Guam, again, sapped more and more strength from the Japanese army. Those troops could have been better employed in the New Guinea offensive in threatening Australia. So thank you for taking the time to watch my presentation. If you enjoyed it, coming in June, I'll be filming a lecture for the 78th anniversary of the Battle of Midway.